Okay, let's get started. So, hey everyone, welcome to Alpha Community Twitter Spaces call. Um, in today's session, we'll be talking about the Web three landscape in Asia with、uh, Mabel Jiang, a partner from Multicoin Capital. Hey, Mabel, how are you? Hey, thanks for inviting. I'm doing pretty well. That's great.、Um, so, before we get started, I'd like to share with you about the agenda very quickly. So, in this session,、uh, we'll be spending around thirty minutes answering questions that I have prepared related to the crypto landscape in Asia, and then we'll be opening the floor for the community to ask any questions or give us any feedbacks. So, if anyone has questions, you can write your questions and use hashtag. Ask Alpha, and then I will read out all your questions. Or you can just raise your hand or request to be a speaker during the Q and A session. Okay, so let's get started. So Mabel,、uh, can you tell us about yourself and what you look at Multicoin Capital? Yes, happy to、um, do that. I think I'll start with just introducing Multicoin a little bit, and then also myself.、Um, So Multicoin is a thesis-driven investment fund. We started 2017. We really started with a、um, thesis-driven hedge fund, which means we don't do anything algorithmic-driven. It's all、um, kind of fundamental analysis, so on and so forth. If if you kind of consider back in 2017, you had that kind of thing.、Um, 2018, we started our first venture fund.、Um, now we are at our fund three.、Um, And then all of us, we were actually pretty boutique compared to some of the the, the peers at the same size.、Um, we only have seven of us on the investment team managing across both the liquid and the illiquid and the private fund.、Um, and then each of us kind of like cover、uh, some different part of the, the the portfolio. We don't really do. We have regional distribution, but we don't do anything with regional mandate. Meaning that. If I sit in Asia, I still get to cover quite a bit of things based in the U.S. The primary reason really is because、um, we we do believe that the crypto market, the Web three market, is very、uh, global, and then a lot of the information flow needs to go both way. And then a lot of the portfolio support actually happens with when whenever a Western portfolio comes over and then wants to have go to market strategy for for Asia, and then so um, um vice versa as well. For me specifically,、um, I sit in Asia,、um, covering quite a bit of things, especially the Southeast Asia and East Asia related deals for Multicoin. Obviously, the, some of the LP parts as well. And then、um, I'd say a lot of the time, what what like the things that time that I spent on was on、um, NFT, which is you know utility NFT and non utility NFTs, as well as some consumer facing products. Um, another big piece that I looked at was data market,、um, more kind of、uh, the the infrastructure layer, like credentialing, like social graph, and what, so on and so forth.、Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Got it.、Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And so, given you're one of the first crypto native VCs in Asia, so how has the crypto landscape in Asia changed since you started in Multicoin Capital in two thousand nineteen? Right, I guess. Um, Mabel. Oh, sorry. I was I was muted. I was talking. Okay. Um, I was saying that it was a bit hard to. Call ourselves, you know, the the fir- one of the first crypto native VCs in Asia. We definitely、um, among our peers in America. I guess we are definitely the first one、um, having a headquarter in Asia.、Um, I'd say quite a bit of innovation before twenty eighteen ha- actually started with、um, Asia specifically with China. Um, there were a lot of OGs came out of the Ethereum community, the Bitcoin community, and whatnot.、Um, and I and I'd say like 2017, quite a few good DeFi pro- protocols. Obviously,、um, you know the ones that still we we know today are the ones based in Silicon Valley. But there were quite a few of them were were doing you know different types of、um, attempts to try out different things、um, back then as well, and also. There were some pretty famous layer ones.、Um, probably many of us don't even remember now, but you know, ones like IOST、um, or some of the other ones like Quantum or Zilliqa. All of them are came like came out from from Asia. 
So I'd say like it was a pretty um, prosperous ecosystem back then. I think as of today, like you know, a lot of the the leading layer one or um, American ones dominant. But still, um, I'd say today a lot of the concentration um, compared to two two three years ago really um, kind of the talents goes to the protocol. Sorry, not not protocol. The middleware layer or the application layer. I think that's like a big kind of shift. Um, it's not that it's not that like people didn't work on application in the past, but it's more that I think Asians generally like to iterate faster, and then they they just you know don't stop. Like you know, there's like a do stuff thesis that we were internally joking about. Um, I think that definitely has a lot of advantage when it comes to you know, shipping um, application layer stuff, where people actually need a lot of iteration every now and then. Yeah. Yeah, so like you mentioned, like this is quite a very fast moving industry. So and like there's a lot of shifts in the Web3 landscape in Asia. So what types of companies do you see coming out of Asia? Like, can you give examples and like maybe perhaps like uh, give example of the difference in the types of the deal flows or projects that you see coming out of Asia versus in the U.S.? Right. I guess like there are a few, um, like I kind of just continue on the line that I mentioned in terms of there are more middleware slash application mm-hmm. layer stuff um, I'm seeing coming out from Asia versus um, like, you know, in, in the U.S. I'm just saying like proportionally. Def- definitely there are a lot of applications and, and, and middleware stuff like in the U.S. and in Europe as well. Um, but like proportionally, Asia has more um, among its um denominator so i think first type where you're seeing there's a lot of guilt tech like today we are, we're seeing a lot of play to earn stuff or, or like you know that so like the guilt tech the dow tooling um quite a few of them actually came out of southeast asia and i think that's really because um people are realizing you know guilds may not necessarily have the network effect but then you know come for a tool say for the network and then people thought about, like, okay, maybe we should start thinking about, like, education piece of the guild. And then, like, next step is really naturally just the guild tech. So I think that really part is, is one part that I've seen a lot um, in terms of deal flows. I'd say, like, on this market, um, among all the guild tech slash DAO tooling that we're seeing, quite a few of them actually, I'd even say even 70% or 80% of them came out from Asia. I think really that's kind of also relevant to how we're seeing um, a lot of the major um, guilds are coming out from Indonesia, from from Philippines and whatnot. Um, And interestingly, even if there are also quite a few guilds maybe in South America, we aren't seeing that many um, guild tech slash DAO tooling coming out from there. I think that's probably because like the, the SaaS market isn't very mature yet. Um, I think the other categories um, would be things like, um, I, at the beginning, I mentioned some of the data market. So there are there are two companies that we actually invested um, in. Our, it's part of our portfolio. One of them is Project Galaxy. The other one is um, uh, Cyber Connect. But there are also some of the other ones that are doing similar stuff. Um, you know, that's covering some of the social graphs, some of the... Um, basically the on-chain social related data layer. Um, and then I think a lot of those companies actually also came out of Asia. I mean, there were one other um, company that A6NZ invested called MEM, MEM. But I think other than that, all the other um, similar peers and working on the same field, they are um, really just from, you know, some, some teams based in Asia. I think part the part of the reason is really and even things like Nansen, right? Well, we didn't invest in Nansen, but I think that's also an, a a good example. Um, I think generally speaking, um, the like in terms of data indexing, data analytics, and stuff, um, there is like a natural gene that the the founders here they they tend to want to work on. So I think that's another category. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. I'd say, like, you know, like I mentioned, in, in 2017, like, we, we've seen um, the, the DeFi projects 
2017, 18, like, like Kyber, um, um, and then like I'm Token and some of the other like kind of like DeFi related, um, well, I guess I'm Token's a wallet, but my point was I can't really recall any of the other Asian uh, based DeFi, but there were definitely quite a few. Um, and then I think in 2021, we, and in 2020, it was kind of a wave of American based or European based DeFi kind of burgeon. But then in 2021, there, there there's definitely a lot of them. Like probably, for example, Abracadabra was was a good example. The the so the so called DeFi 2.0 was was an interesting one. So I guess in terms of I don't want to I don't like to have like stereotype, but to some extent I think Asian are very good at finding you know areas of improvement and then try to optimize the product. Um, so I think a lot of the even if you know maybe some of the original um the first one was not uh, projects coming from asia i think a lot of the much better improved version of it actually were were produced by founders from asia i know i've been probably a little bit stereotyping too much but i, I like also like this question is also about like summary so um yeah just bear with me with that <laughs> yeah i completely agree with you uh in Asia, like we have lots of guild tech, like we also for as for Alpha Adventure DAO, we also incubated the guild five, which is also like doing guild as well. Um, so moving on, like in terms of like building a project in Asia, like what would be your advice to project founders in here for anyone who wants to st or new founders who want to start a crypto project? Right, I think. I guess like this advice is actually not just to people who base here, but um, generally any founder. I realized that. So I give I gave a listen to the latest episode of Uncommon Core. I think one of the interesting point that Sue mentioned there, kind of, I I definitely can't agree more. Which is a lot of people, which young people, just move over to wherever, um, wherever that um, their friends or the community moves to. Which means like you know for for the founder case. It's often people go to Lisbon, they go to Dubai, they go to Singapore, maybe. Maybe Singapore is a bit too expensive and everything um, for the, the young founders. But it's generally like, you know, you, you want to move to some of the place where the other developers are. Um, so I'd say thinking about regulation and compliance is definitely something that people should. Now, if you, you're not thinking about it in 2018, 19, you should have been thinking about it now at the starting point when you're starting a um, a, a company or a project just because oftentimes it's not just about like you know tax and everything but also what are you can offer something to um, what types of users obviously U.S. has a very stringent rules um, China has a very stringent rules so I'd say like that's a definitely a very important piece just like where just like where you start where you register your jurisdiction and whatnot um, I think the other part to consider is um the place that you move to uh, in addition to have like in addition that they have some good like very lenient um laws like you also want the the place to have a lot of um good developers and it's really easy to hire i think that's also another component um but i'm seeing an interesting trend that for example indian founders are moving to dubai um because of the the lenient laws and then in portugal like they're doing similar things and a lot of people came moved over to 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 Portugal as well, and then you know, instead of Berlin in the past in twenty eighteen nineteen, and then in the U S, like we are seeing a lot of people moving to Miami and even, um, oh my God, where 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 is FTX based? Uh, not not Bermuda. What's the anyway? Like you know the place I'm talking about, but basically there are a, a few places that used not to be a lot of people and not a lot of developers, and all of a sudden. People realize that um, it's it's actually very nice the place to be, and then like the the talents goes over. I think that's also another interesting component to to think about, which is like the the talents is easier to hire. But obviously, people today they um they can do remote and whatever. But oftentimes, it will be good to have to just be with the developer communities, um like often like you know kind of day by day, so that you can exchange thoughts and whatnot, which is a good experience for sure. Um. And I and I think and I think another I guess like we can touch upon that later on. But another thing that um, 
a lot of the time Asian founders do not do too well compared to some of the peers in the U.S. is that the narrative setting. Um, I'd say for Web3 um, portfolios or uh, Web3 what, what, projects, around generally speaking, setting the right narratives is as important as shipping the product. Like I said earlier, um, Asian founders, they're really good at shipping products. Um, I, I Again, like it's a bit stereotyping, but this is definitely um, often the case. But then like oftentimes people don't realize that they actually ship quite a bit of things because they don't tell a very good story or they don't give very good updates. So I'd say like if you look at a lot of these um, really successful projects or the ones that have very strong communities, um, either Abracadabra or even just Alpha, um, um, and what else? There, there were quite a few of those. Oh, and even Step N. Um, these are considered relatively popular projects. And then what they do, um, they share the same thing, which is they update all the time, they iterate all the time, and then they also tell the community what they have been doing. So it's not just about doing things, but also it's about you know let, letting your community know that you have done things. So it's not just about do stuff, but also about um, try really hard to let the um, the whole world know about that. So I thought that was very interesting um, thing that a lot of Asian math founders may have ignored in the past, but should start, you know, really think about how they can, you know, better improve or optimize that strategy. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that insight. Um, so there's also another element that, um, all founders have to go through when building their own crypto projects, which is a uh, funding. So are there like any difference in terms of funding availability in Asia versus in the US? Like what's your advice to founders who wants to fundraise from top tier crypto funds? Right. I think there are a few things that I've been thinking about quite a bit. So I realized that there's a trend of founders, especially very good founders, take, they just want to um, optimize the valuation. But oftentimes, I would actually appreciate someone who know that they could raise a ton of money, but at the same time, kind of just choose the one that they really need. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that because um, I felt that we, we can get a better deal, or whatever. It's just more that I think it's, it's better... For, for a group of founders to know at the even beginning that what they really wanted to optimize for. I mean, sure, like, you know, some some people would want to optimize for um, just, you know, getting as much money as possible, but that also means, like, you know, the quality of the, the help that they're getting from, from the investors are not going to be um, the same for every single investor. Some investor will care it more, some investor will care less simply because some investors just like have too much money to spare and then they um, they can simply not care, just like spray and pray. Versus um, like there are some investors who are just known for, you know, help providing top notch help and then providing help and reach out, reach out to you doing all kinds of ED, even with without you asking them to do. So I think that's really, um, I'd say like for, for a lot of the, the top notch founders, they definitely have that caliber to judge. It's just a matter of whether they um, would want to think about that or not. Um, I think that's one. I think the other thing about the funding availability, um, it's quite relevant to what I said earlier about the, the third point of comment, which is like about narrative setting. Um, I'd say a lot of the good, projects that got great funding um, that are based in Asia oftentimes is because they are not only good engineers and good product managers but also they know how to set the narratives right um, to the market um, that involves you know in terms of the pace like you know when do you tell like what what kind of things like you you, you talk about at what stage and also it it's um, also related to whether you can uh... um, I think we're losing you. Are you unmuted? No, can you, can you still hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. Uh, where did you drop? Where did I drop? So you were talking about the 
the setting narrative for Asia. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying that. I think it's also pretty important for for founders to be able to to accept that they can just focus on one thing rather than a a hundred things. Because I think there's like a general or na- like natural tendency for founders in Asia to create a super app. And then try to do everything, and try to tell people that we can do a hundred different things. But actually, being focused is a merit, and it's a rare thing that a lot of people can't really do because, again, it means like you know what you run, what we're trying to optimize for. I think most of the top-notch VC they really appreciate founders who know what their limit is, and then to be very focused, and then just try to figure out one thing at a time. Um, yeah. So I think that's those comments are related to、um, funding availability because I I think at the end of the day,、um, for especially for Web three native funds, there's no such notion called regional mandate. It's not like Sequoia or some of the other、um, like large other VCs like they would have such thing called like oh I cover Asia so I don't know other I don't I don't look at other things like I think for most of the crypto native VCs they they look at everything. So then it just comes to whether You can address your narrative, your story,、um, and then the try to be focused.、Um, try not to do everything,、uh, even if you could. Yeah. Great. That's a very good insight.、Um, so, but there's a lot of process for founders to go through aside from like funding, doing fundraising. There's like community building, marketing, branding. So, what kind of support do you think founders in Asia need most? And like, where can they go to get that support? Right. So I think the the mind share is definitely one. Simply because I think geographically speaking, today we are. I mean, we are kind of back to normal more or less. And then people start to attend different types of events. I'd say、um, in between twenty seventeen to nineteen, there are a lot more Asia based events、um, than today. I think today a lot of those events just concentrate in in U.S. and also Europe. So I think the mind share definitely part of it comes from the fact that you're physically being in that venue, where where everyone else, where where all the other developers are being in there that that place at the same time. So I think one thing is really、um, if you're not going to be physically able, like you're not going to be available physically there all the time, then you need. Some、um, supporters to to help to <clears throat> amplify your presence to the community, and I think that's sometimes what、uh, the the fan the the investors from、um, who are famous relatively on, on the internet who have followers across the the world can be helpful.、Um, I know this is kind of cliche, but I I think that's super important. It's just like why a lot of the, the Um, the projects they also need to involve some of the key opinion leaders or influencers, similar type of um, um, idea. I think the other the other piece really is、um, how. Well, I guess like one one thing that we don't really need to help, or we don't try to help the the founders really like how they think about their product. Um. Because I I realize that oftentimes the best founders often they do not. Know how to tell the story right, but they somehow get a right sense about like you know what should be the next. And oftentimes, when they're extremely in- insistent about something, and then you disagree, like you are often wrong. They are often right. So I think in terms of product roadmap and a lot of the other things, as long as like these people are head down and like constantly thinking about like the specific focus that they wanted to, the, the problem they want to address, I think that's fine. So I think in in addition to what like the support that the founders need, I think there's also some sort of limit that I think some of the、um, investors should not be giving to the founders. Often just because I think investors often have the problem of like imposter、um, syndrome, which is like you may not really know the thing as well as some of the founders. So I thought that's also an interesting、um, observation that I had. Um, I think in addition to that, like I, I feel I'm just repeating myself and again and again. But narrative setting is also extremely important. Just like how,、um, let's say Solana comes to Asia, and then they need to adjust how they market to this market. 
um, the the flip side, a lot of the fa- um the, the projects based in Asia, when they try to market themselves to the Western world, they also need to think about um, that. And then oftentimes the go-to-market strategy needs to be adjusted based on the region that you're marketing towards. Um, of course, I'd say like for DeFi project, it's probably less so than some of the other things that emphasize a lot more on the UI. For example, wallets or exchange, like you can tell um, like the, the American users are definitely have a different taste than the, the Asia-based users or even just East Asia versus Indian users. So um, I think that's another thing, which is like if you have local kind of um, UI UX support, I think that's also be, going to be extremely helpful. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's that. Thank you, Mabel. I also think that another support founders can get is by joining incubator programs, especially where um, they're hosted by uh, builders themselves. I completely agree how like sometimes um, investors, they some some key things that uh, move the pieces really only builders can identify. Okay, so um, before mm-hmm. we open the floor for the community to ask questions, I have one last question for you. And Mm -hmm. so what are you bullish about for the next one year for the crypto landscape in Asia? Um, I think there will be an interesting involvement in terms of some of the the Dow tooling and Gil Tech. I think I mentioned that earlier in the call. And And I think that kind of is related to how... So today, I think we are just seeing a ton of different guilds that are targeting the same problems and trying to, you know, just do the same thing. We were definitely seeing a lot of verticalization um, and specialization happening for, for that specific field. Um, and I and I think similarly, um, we are going to see a lot of um, the, I guess, I guess not, not, not game specifically, but like gamified behavior that are going to be happen, happening. What I'm, what I'm, um, kind of tr- trying to say is like things like step in like let me spe- let me speak or some of the other um these kind of quote unquote games they're not really games so to speak they're really just gamified behavior they're trying to in- introduce some sort of me- mechanism that in incentivize to you know you to change your existing behavior and i thought that was kind of interesting i think oftentimes this type of um things are, are created by by asian founders simply because um, they are very deep in terms of user behavior, just like how TikTok uh, back in five years ago, no one would even imagine that the influencers can just sell stuff with live stream. But yes, they, they that that's definitely not uh, a monetization kind of um, typical monetization route. But like they did, they did create it. So I think that kind of thing may happen again and again meaning like the, the deep insights of human behavior kind of get translated into how they design the, the um, incentive mechanism. I think, I think that could be extremely exciting. Um, and, I, and I think um, following what I said earlier about data market, I still strongly believe that um, because the, the, the very, like, huge variety of social media, of Web2 social media, have, like we, we were seeing in Asia, I think we are going to be see a lot, see, seeing a lot of um, founders coming out of, you know, the traditional space and try to solve some sort of problems um, related to, to social. I mean, today, like a lot of people are trying to recreate um, maybe like another Telegram or like, you know, Web3 Discord or Web3 WeChat or whatever. Maybe those are not the answers. But I think um, as a lot of these talents who are like, who, who used to have a lot of insights about uh, maybe growth hacking for social and they have spent maybe one or two years in the space, like they will get a lot of native thoughts kind of on top of what they had uh, with the social building experience in the past. I think that can be extremely um, powerful because there might be some sort of new product that we can't just can't imagine today be created um, at that point. So I, I think that would also be pretty interesting in terms of the social consumer products. Great. Um, thank you so much, Mabel, for giving lots, lots of insights and 
knowledge and advice with us here today. So, um, all right. So that's it for the questions from my side. Um, now let's open the floor to our listeners. So feel free to ask permission to become speakers if you have any questions, or you can also uh, write your questions and use hashtag AskAlpha, and I will read out your questions in this Twitter space. Okay, so we have Colin Lee here. Hi, Colin. Hello, hello. Uh, hello, Mabel. Thank you for your sharing. And I have one question. Uh, you know, China, I'm from China. And um, last year, uh, Chinese government gave uh, very strict uh, regulations on blockchain industry. So the miners, the founders, and uh, also some ventures are leaving China to some other places like Singapore, Japan, or the U.S. And uh, there's nearly no uh, users, or uh, there's nearly no users in in China. So as a uh, uh, as a Chinese-based ventures, what's the what's the how to say what's the solution, or what's what's the better strategies for those kind of ventures? Because there's nearly no or very View projects in the uh, local markets. Thank you. Um, oh, I mean, I really can't speak for other people, but I, I think for us, I'm definitely seeing a lot of very, very high quality founders coming out from the Web2 companies. Um, they are very well trained, but at the same time, they have very good product insights. Um, in terms of what they want to do. And then learn, they learn very fast. So these people, they might want to do something, have some exploration in, in the Web3 space. And at the same time, I'm sure you're aware that a lot of the Chinese companies are being cracked down anyways. Um, the gaming ones, the, anything that's related to entertainment or online education and whatnot. There were a, a affluent of talent um, people coming in. So I, I actually was quite bullish about that i mean that's also part of the reason that i'm still spending quite a bit of time trying to meet with these people i mean sure like they might be not as web3 native today but it's gonna only take them six months or 12 months max to catch up everything and be um very integrated in the space and they can find, like i said they can find, find a lot of very interesting stuff um from like f f it's just similar to how like the mobile internet era for, for China, we've, we've seen so many great things, great innovation um, kind of happening on, on this ground. So I think you should be, or I said, we, we should be relatively confident. And in terms of, and then I think the other part of this is like, where can they be safely founding these companies? I guess my, 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 my answer was also kind of mentioned earlier in, in this discussion, which is, if they really had a good idea, at the end of the day, it all all it matters is the people, and it doesn't matter where they are. They can move to Dubai, they can move to Singapore, wherever, um, any place that they are, they can be compliantly founding these things. I think building this these things, I think that's fine, um, because at the end of the day, it's about people, right? Um, if you have the right right people building those doesn't matter if they are still in, in the mainland China, they can move somewhere else. Um, I know I'm not like addressing to the questions directly what you're asking, you're asking what other ventures going to do. But I really can't speak for other people. But all I can say is if any of them are still looking at the space here, I think there are still quite a bit of opportunity. It just matter like how you make that happen. And I think if people are capable, they will make it happen. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so if anyone else has any question, uh, you can request to become a speaker right now.
Okay, so I guess while we wait for some questions from the audience, is there anything, Mabel, you'd like to share about the current Web3 landscape in Asia? Mm, I think... I think we are seeing interesting trends of some of the large conglomerate we're trying to explore this space as well. Um, obviously, they were probably not able to embrace the comp- like the open source permissionless world, but I think the the intelligence coming in could be interesting. I guess that's that's something I didn't mention earlier. I mean, it's it's very obvious that a lot of the U.S. U.S. companies are already doing it, and obviously there were some regulatory challenges um, related to, you know, for example, Facebook back in like Meta back in the days when they try something. But I but I think but I think um, at the end of the day, like once some of these companies decided to, will really work on a permissionless project. Um, at the end, they would have to let it be independent, and then um, instead of really just incubating it inside of the company, that specific protocol or maybe an open source project has to be independent. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. So we have a question from Alice. Um. You may ask your question now. Yep. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mabel. I'm your fan of your uh, podcast. Nice to meet you here. Yeah, uh, the question. Yeah, the question is the recently the X to earn topics is really hot. So, do you have any comments for that kind of projects like uh, Step In uh, or Let Me Speak? Um. So, I think Let Me Speak and Step In are, are actually quite two two quite different projects. Let Me Speak. It has a very good learning product itself but the tokenomics or the the in-game economics was actually not very like there weren't that many things that you can do with the, the token um or i guess like you can say the utility of the the token isn't quite affluent um it's really the product itself is actually really good but i think if they try to work on more use cases for for the token it could be interesting um, in terms of step N, I think they really understood how to massage people's um, mentality, meaning that you, at the beginning, like maybe you earn something, but later on, it's all about the randomness that attracts you. You know, when you open up the, the box, the loot, um, you, you open a green box, like you get a gray shoes, or, you know, and if you try to, um, free, um, kind of just like get a get a get a green green like let's say you had a green shoe and then another gray and then you you get a kit for that and then maybe you don't get it's all maybe you don't get a green again so it's all about randomness I think that that team I guess like the only comment I had was the team was really good at kind of leverage um, the the drive of people really wanting to gamble and then make sure that because people like to gamble um that's just like part of humanity um so that people are actually using the gst which is the in-game token to to buy those kind of happiness so i thought that was very interesting and very smart of them i guess like the team had definitely had a lot of um, mobile gaming experience so they could um set all the parameters and in like in-game economy right so like the inflation and so on and so forth isn't very obvious even if right now i think they're at a pretty significant um daily active user level um i guess like it's really hard to have a generic comments on all of these xyz to earn thing just because i think a lot of them aren't designed very well or i'd say like there's it's it there's like a constant question of where does the organic demand come from for the in-game token um, so I think for, for Let Me Speak, it, there wasn't really significant use cases. So I guess like, we will have to see. But the product itself is very good. And then, like I said, Step N, they actually found a lot of different places 
for people to use to spend their GST. But at the same time, that was because people they realized that humanity was the root of humanity is about gambling and stuff, and then they just leverage that and make sure people kind of spend a lot of money on that. And then for a lot of the other ones, um, I'd say the gameplay and the the in game economy are are very separated, which means um, sometimes like the games aren't very interesting. It's all about just making money. So then, how do you make sure that this quote unquote Ponzi doesn't crash? I think that's also art and science. Um, we are yet to see how Axie can survive or not, but. To some extent, I think Axie Infinity is also at the the stage where they have enough mind share that they can work on a lot of different things to make it work. Um, and then in terms of some of the other ones, I just guess um, if you can't really change human behavior, it's probably really hard to find a new business model. So then, like let's say if Ponzi works first time, it may not necessarily work the second time. So I think at the end of the day, it's all about trying to set the right incentives and then change people's human behavior once and for all, and then from there you can probably innovate a new business model that people can actually earn money. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Okay,、um, thank you, Mabel, for joining us today.、Um, So, me and Mabel will be staying for a little bit more.、Um, if anyone has questions,、um, feel free to request to become speaker now.、Um, otherwise, I guess that's it for today. Okay, so. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in,、um, and thank you, Mabel, as well, for joining us.、Uh, I guess that's it for today, and see you all again in the next Twitter Space on Friday. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Mabel. You thank you, everyone.